Hello, welcome to my channel. My name is Nico Carver. I'm a deep sky astrophotographer and uh, I share these videos with you all to help uh, beginners uh, who are interested in deep sky astrophotography and with some tips that I've learned along the way. And uh, I also just like sort of sharing what I'm up to. And uh, I'm a gearhead, so I talk a lot about the gear that I use and what it does. And uh, we'll start with that today. But the this video actually uh, came from a comment on one of my other videos. So I do look at the comments and the comment was from Patrick Hand who commented, can you create a video showing your workflow for a basic capture of M42? I am new to DSO imaging. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, M42 is Messier 42. Messier was an astronomer that uh, came up with a list of things that were not comets, uh, but that list is still being used today. Uh, it's mostly galaxies, clusters, and nebulae like the one we're seeing right here. This is the Orion Nebula, also known as M42. Uh, we're actually seeing more than just M42 here. This little part right there is M43. And then in the picture that I'm gonna capture, we'll also get the Running Man Nebula. Um, anyways, so the idea, basic idea with this video is start to finish every step, how do you make a DSO image? Um, so it's gonna be probably a pretty long video. I'm gonna start here in the house explaining what equipment that I'm gonna use and uh, why you know, I'm using this particular equipment. I'm using pretty beginner equipment to, to today or tonight. Um, and then we'll go on to setting up the equipment, making sure we know how it works, then actually setting it up you know, in the location in a dark site, um, and starting the capture process, making sure that uh, we're at the right exposure level, everything looks good, uh, capturing what we call our light frames, that's of the actual object, so we're gonna try to do maybe I don't know, 130 second exposures of M42 and see what we get out of that. And then I'll show making the calibration frames. Those are to help uh, with certain kinds of noise, uh, things like dark current and uh, fixed pattern noise on the sensor. We'll get more into that, but they're basically the darks, the bias and the flat frames. And we're gonna capture each of those and I'll show you how. Then uh, once we have all of that data, we'll take a look at it. What do these things look like in their raw state? And we'll move on to processing. Now, because uh, we could go with a bunch of different directions in processing, in this main video, I'm going to do Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop. Uh, Deep Sky Stacker is free and Photoshop is just really popular. So uh, I think a lot of people might be interested in that combination of programs. Then I'm gonna have some other videos below this one where it sort of branches out. So you could watch the first half of this video, everything about capture, and then switch to another processing video if you don't use Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop. I'll have one video that goes into doing it all in PixInsight and then another video that shows Deep Sky Stacker plus GIMP, which is a free Photoshop alternative. So if you're a beginner and you don't wanna spend any money on software, you could watch that uh, Deep Sky Stacker plus GIMP video to uh, show what you could do with just free software. Because this video is for people who are new to DSO imaging, I wanna start with uh, affordable gear here um, and also not overcomplicate this video because it could go on for hours if I throw in everything, auto guiding and computer control and plate solving and everything like that. So I'm just going to show uh, basically using the mount with the hand control, uh, using a basic telescope in DSLR um, and that's it. No auto guiding, nothing like that. Um, short exposures on a bright target. Let's break down the gear that we'll use tonight. We'll start with this. This is the mount I'm gonna use. This is actually just the mount head. It goes on a 
tripod. Um, but this is the part that actually does the work. It has the stepper motors inside here. And uh, this is, uh, I have a video unboxing this. You can watch that if you want to. I've made a few little changes to it. Um, I have an adapter so I can use my QHY Pole Master for polar alignment. Um, I changed out some of the knobs and uh, added some little um, waterproof Velcro things here to attach different things to it. Um, but other than that, it's pretty much stock. Um, I'm, I'm going to be using it just with the hand controller tonight. I'm not going to do computer control. And I'm also just going to be running it off, if I can get this open, AA batteries. So eight double A's, which is really nice because there's not going to be any wires hanging off my setup tonight. It's been a long time since I've had an astrophotography setup with no wires hanging off. Um, but this is going to be all running off internal batteries, including the mount. So that's going to be really fun. Um, this accepts a Vixen dovetail. And I want to point out that it might look like I'm endorsing this mount. I don't accept any endorsements um, from any company. Um, I just, I've bought this personally. The reason I bought it was for travel because the case for this is small enough that I can bring it carry on on an airplane. That's the reason I bought this mount. It's not necessarily the mount I would recommend for a beginner mount. Uh, if you're new to deep sky astrophotography. The reason is, is it's not going to give you much room to grow. Um, you can't put much weight on it, uh, really only like 10 pounds and under, or maybe nine pounds and under. Um, and it's not super accurate. Uh, it's not like um, a more, you know, beefy equatorial mount like an Orion Atlas, which is my main one that I use. And so it's not going to give you those results that you're going to want as a beginner, and you're just going to be fighting it too much. So it's not really what I'd recommend if you're new to this. I would save a little bit more, buy use, do something to get a little bit uh, bigger mount. But uh, I'll try to do a review of this soon because um, I think it would really uh, benefit people who want a travel mount that uh, is a full equatorial mount, can do go-to, can do guiding, theoretically, still working on that. Um, and so anyways, enough said about this. The scope that I'm gonna be using, the telescope, is this one right here. This is the, as you can see on the side there, Astrotech AT 60 ED. It's a doublet design. The nice thing about a doublet is that they can stay pretty low weight. Once you add another, you know, the more elements of glass that you add into a telescope design, the heavier it gets. Um, the other nice thing about this scope is, look, watch this. That's how small it gets. So it's very portable. I can actually rack the focuser in here. You can see it gets quite small. Um, Speaking of the focuser, this is the best part of this mount, or I mean telescope, that this is the best part of this telescope, that it is $370 telescope, but it actually comes with a really nice two inch rack and pinion focuser uh, that, has all, that really works. It holds enough weight, uh, it has a scale there on the side, it's nice and smooth, it has the dual speed, I haven't noticed any backlash. So this focuser is rock solid, which is rare to find on a cheap telescope like this. Cheap is relative, of course. Speaking of cheap telescopes, you might be wondering, well, why would I get uh, something like this with so little aperture uh, when for four or $500, I could instead buy uh, like a fast Newtonian, like a six inch or an eight inch Newtonian? It's a good question. The learning curve on a Newtonian is gonna be much steeper um, and you're probably gonna to have to make more upgrades. I haven't found any of those like $400 Newtonians that actually have a good stock focuser. So you'd probably have to replace it. So that might double the cost. Um, and just, you would also need a much better mount. Uh, I've struggled with an eight inch Newtonian on my Orion Atlas. You'd really want to move up into like a Lasmandi or astrophysics mount probably uh, to really get good results. So you're going to need a much better mount. If you have all the money in the world, that might work for you. But if you're looking for something cheap, beginner wise, this scope I would recommend. Or like a 70 millimeter, 80 millimeter refractor would be fine too. 
but this one uh, is nice and lightweight and like I said $370 there's a couple things I added to it that brought up the total cost to 500 um, this first one is called the camera angle uh, adjuster and you basically uh, loosen a screw here and then this whole part right here can now rotate and that's really nice for framing objects because a lot of times just the stock rotation you know with the camera level like this is not going to really work you don't really want to have to like undo a bunch of threads and everything to change the rotation of the camera so having a little screw right there that i can just loosen up and then tighten back down when i got the angle that i want is really nice this i think was 30 or 40 dollars um and then behind that this is the astrotech 80 at 60 d field flattener it's just a field flattener so a lot of times you'll find flatteners also are reducers meaning they change the focal length and the speed this one doesn't do that it just flattens the field so this telescope stays at 360 millimeters focal length but what a field flattener does is normally with a refractor um, you'll notice that if you're using a big chip like in a DSLR the center of the field is nice and flat meaning you have nice round good stars but as you get closer to the corners and the edges of your frame all the stars start warping and they warp out towards the corners so you'll see that they have this pattern where they're going out like this and these bottom corners and out like this and these top corners and to avoid that the only what thing we can do is get a field flattener for our telescope or by uh, a design like a quad where the flattener element is built into the telescope this is a hundred dollars for imaging i think this is probably essential the camera angle adjuster is not quite as essential but i would definitely get a field flattener with this telescope and this is just a 48 millimeter uh, t2 canon adapter and then oh and then a, a vixen plate this did not come with the telescope you could mount it other ways but i like the vixen plate especially for most uh, uh equatorial mounts this is what you would want uh, these are really cheap though you can get these basically anywhere even used okay so that's the telescope it's the again the astrotech at 60 ed and uh, this hanging off the back of it here is the camera that I'll use tonight. This is a Canon T6i. It's uh, not modified. Some people modify their DSLRs. They remove uh, certain low pass filters and uh, things that are riding in front of the sensor to get better HA sensitivity. This one has not been modified in any way. Um, so it's stock. Um, I also have not put on Magic Lantern firmware, which is something I would usually do because <laughs> Canon DSLRs do not uh, have usually a built-in intervalometer, uh, meaning a way to take uh, many exposures without touching the camera. So tonight I'll be using a uh, newer or newer, uh, just a cheap intervalometer you can get on Amazon. Um, I'll put the link to all this stuff uh, on my website. You just plug this in and then you program how many pictures you want to take and uh, for how long. The delay between the pictures is basically just if I set 30 second pictures on the camera and then I say take a picture every 35 seconds on here, then there would be a five second delay between each 30 second exposure. The reason you might want to program a little delay in is because otherwise uh, you can get a little bit of a vibration effect from the from the mirror uh, closing and shutting. All right, so intervalometer, good, uh, easy thing to get, about $20. Uh, if you're not comfortable with putting something like Magic Lantern on your Canon camera. Speaking of the camera, um, I'm a Canon person, I always have been, but for astrophotography, Canon or Nikon DSLRs work really well, especially when you're starting out. Um, why not Sony or one of the other brands? Only Canon and Nikon DSLRs uh, since about 2011 or 12 have been consistent about not altering the raw file. 
Uh, we'll get more into what or why you want raw files when we get into processing. But basically, you for astrophotography, your camera has to be set to raw, and you want just an unadulterated raw file. Um, Sony and some of the other brands have this problem called the Star Eater, where uh, the RAW is optimized for daytime use, so they lower the some there's some kind of noise uh, adjustment or something. But when you do that for astrophotography, it kills a lot of the dim stars, and it's just no good. Um, so Canon or Nikon DSLR are definitely the most popular for a reason. They also have the most support. If you later on decide you want to hook this up to a laptop, there's something called Backyard EOS or Backyard Nikon that can control the camera for you, and then you wouldn't need this anymore. Okay, uh, so I said just mount, scope, camera. There's actually one more piece uh, that you would want with a setup like this one, uh, which is uh, some kind of finder. If you have a computer controlling everything, you can just plate solve, which means it takes a picture of the sky and then it knows where it's pointed and it can adjust. But when you don't have a computer connected, um, you can't rely just on go to using the mount because a lot of times it's not super accurate until you train the mount. So what you need is a, some kind of finding device. Um, basically just a wider field of view that's going to point at the sky and uh, sort of tell you where you are pointed so you can make adjustments. I have a bunch of different ones here just to show. Um, this first one that I'm going to show is a scope stuff uh, green laser and this has a little mount on it so that I could just put it right there in the uh, shoe mount on the DSLR and then just press that and I get a laser, okay? So this would tell me where I'm pointed just by shining a green laser out into the sky and I see that laser beam going out into the sky and I know where I'm pointed then. I like this a lot, it's very easy to use uh, and very uh, accurate. Um, but the problem with using this is right now I'm in a populated area near the Philadelphia airport so this is frowned upon because you don't want to accidentally uh, shine the, the laser at an airplane um, and blind the uh, pilot or something like that. So don't use this if you're anywhere near an airport, but if you were out somewhere really dark with no airplanes, uh, this might be a good option. Another option, I use this a lot when I'm doing visual astronomy. Uh, this is what's called an RACI finder scope. Uh, the RACI stands for right angle, meaning you can look down into it rather than having to be back like that. And the CI means uh, corrected image. So it, uh, instead of reversing the image in there, it's corrected. Um, so I really like this, very easy to use. Um, you could just put this on either of these little brackets right here and tighten it up. And then you have a nice finder scope. I don't usually use this one for astrophotography just because, um, I don't know why exactly, but it's just, it's a smaller field of view and I just find it takes a little bit longer uh, to find things with this. For visual astronomy, I don't really care. I'm actually, with visual astronomy, usually looking at pretty bright objects like the planets and things like that, so this works perfectly fine. But for dimmer stuff, um, I like seeing a, a, a broader field and this one, uh, sort of limits your field. It's probably not much uh, wider field of view than just looking through the camera. So I use this more for visual, like when I'm using a Dobsonian. Uh, what will I show next here? Telrad. This is probably my favorite of all the finder scope designs. Um, what this does is it has a leveling base. Um, so you can really, uh, or a leveling thing right there actually, so you can really make sure that it's aligned with your telescope. Um, and this also I can just slide in right here. Like that. And uh, you can see it's sort of elevated. And what you do is you just look with both eyes and you just look right through like that and turn it on right here and it puts a little red target onto the sky. And that's all it is. It just puts a little red target onto the sky um, right in there. And 
I find this really easy to use and really accurate because I can just see that red target and uh, get the object perfectly or the star perfectly centered. Um, only downside with this is that sometimes this piece right here fogs or, or frosts up and uh, then it becomes unusable. All right, last one. I know a lot of finder options. Um, this is the one that I'm planning to use when I'm bringing this rig traveling because it's the smallest and lightest of all these options. This is a red dot finder. Um, this is just a no-name brand red dot finder I got on Amazon. Um, it's also adjustable, so you can make sure that you're pointed uh, at the same thing with this and the telescope uh, before you start finding stuff with it. And then uh, turns on right here. Maybe. Oh, maybe that was an adjustment. Whoops. Turns on here. There we go. And so what it does is it puts a little uh, red dot in the middle of this. And then you just look through that. Again, you can just use both eyes open at the sky. And just like this one, it just puts a little red target uh, where you're pointed. The only difference between these two really is that this is just one little harsh red dot and that is a more uh, adjustable uh, big target thing. Um, and so I like that one a little bit uh, better in terms of just looking at it. This one, the field of view is a little bit smaller. You know, this little target thing here is smaller than that. Um, and sometimes I have to sort of squint to see where exactly I'm pointed with this one. But for travel, you probably couldn't, can't beat this. It's also incredibly uh, lightweight. So this adds basically nothing to the weight of this whole thing. All right, that's enough on finders, but it's probably essential with something like this where you don't have computer control to use some kind of finder. Okay, now I'm gonna go through some tips and things to do with this equipment before you take it out. Um, first thing is, if all this equipment is new to you, I don't re recommend taking it all out on a dark, cold night uh, and trying to get it all working in the dark. Um, even if you have some kind of, you know, like red flashlight or something, uh, it's still really hard to really get to know your equipment for the first time in a dark setting. So I would recommend working with it, you know, inside or on a sunny day um, and just really playing around with it and making sure you understand how everything works. Um, another thing you can do on a sunny day is uh, find the about the right infinity focus for your telescope uh, with your DSLR. Um, you can just point it at a, like a far off thing, like a radio tower or a cell phone tower, and then just rack the focus in and out until you have sharp focus. And then you can either just leave it like that, if, if that's an option, or you can just note uh, how far out it is. This one's really nice because it has a scale, so I can just see, okay, 22 millimeters out is about the right focus. That's a really nice thing to do before you bring it out under the stars because one thing that often confuses beginners is if you're too far out of focus, like if I was like that and I looked into my DSLR, I probably just wouldn't see anything even though I'm pointed at the night sky, I have my lens cap off, it just looks completely black. And a lot of times then a beginner would just assume, oh, something's really wrong, what's going on here, I, this isn't working, and you know. But all they would have to do really is just rack the focus in and out, and eventually you'll see the stars come in. They'll be really blurry at first and then they'll get more pinpoint. Um, the reason though that when you're really far out of focus it, that you don't see anything is because that light from that stars just scatters way too much, so you just don't see anything in here. When you get it closer and closer, that light cone comes together and then 
eventually you get those pinpoint stars, which is what you want. Okay. Um, and then, so if you have it at about the correct focus uh, when you start, then you can just move to this fine reduction knob and just fine tune it. Uh, either by eye, you can just try to get the star as small as possible, or you can use a Badenov mask, uh, which I've covered in another video. Um, but it's basically just a, a pattern that you put in front of the scope here, and then you make a reproducible pattern on your live view, and you can adjust it until this spike is centered between two other spikes. Get one if you've never tried it. They're really uh, fun to use. Other thing you would want to do before uh, going out, other than getting to know your equipment, is make sure you have all fresh batteries, fresh SD cards, um, and backups. So I always bring backups of everything I can. You know, definitely batteries and memory cards, but anything else, like even finder scopes, I'll bring backups um, because things will go wrong. You know. There's tons of problems at night, uh, dew and frost and all these uh, things, and b batteries will drain very quickly because it's cold out. Um, so bring backups of everything. What else? Um, we want to make sure that we've set um, a number of camera settings on a DSLR before we go out, because um, a lot of times if you don't do it before you go out at night, you get excited and you've miss some crucial camera setting like uh, you have it set on JPEG or something like that and then the night is sort of ruined. So I always make sure that some camera settings, you know, you can't pick them all uh, right away, but some of the basic ones are set inside before I leave the house. So I'm going to show you a few of those now. We're now going to look at camera settings. This is again a Canon T6i. Um, however, I think these camera settings will be will make sense no matter what model of camera you have. Um, but some of them, you know, in terms of the location and things and menus, might be a little Canon specific. But hopefully, you'll be able to find all this stuff in Nikon or or whatever uh, camera you have. Um, so uh, I've just turned on the camera. It gives me this uh, screen right here, uh, which shows me a few good pieces of information. Um, down here, this number in the that corner is the number of exposures that I could do. But keep in mind, this might be set on JPEG. So this number might be lying right now. Right there is my battery indicator. So I'd always want to make sure I have a charged battery before going out. Um, because I have a telescope attached, it automatically switches to manual focus, which is good. Um, and it also doesn't give me an option to change the uh, F number there, the aperture setting, because it knows that it can't. Um, if it, some on Canon lenses and lenses meant for this system, you, you could change that number with uh, the aperture blades, you know, stopping down the lens, but with a telescope, it's fixed. This is an f6 scope, and it is always f6, unless you get a reducer. Okay, anyways, um, that's all of that. The first thing I notice here is in the upper left, we're in aperture priority mode. For astrophotography, we either want to be in manual exposure mode, or if your camera has it, bulb mode, perhaps, if you want longer than 30 second exposures. Next thing I'm going to do is we're at 1 60th of a second in terms of the shutter speed on manual mode. I'm going to change that to 6 or maybe 10 seconds, something like that, because even if we're planning to take 30 second exposures in the end, when I'm just doing my testing, you know, testing focus and things like that under a dark sky, I usually want something around 5 to 10 second exposures. So I'm going to do 10 seconds. Next thing I'm going to do here is I can see we're on auto white balance. I don't want auto white balance. So I'm going to hit Q here, and move up to that one, and change it to daylight white balance. Um, if you are not using any filters and a stock DSLR, you want daylight white balance. If you are using something like a light pollution filter, you would instead want to set a custom white balance where 
with the filter on you go out and take a picture of something white like a white card with that filter in there to make a custom white balance but since i'm not using any filters i'm going to use daylight white balance if you just leave it on auto white balance that's not gonna uh, be good because it'll change uh, the color temperature of the scene automatically but it doesn't know what it's doing because it's night so daylight's better uh, what else here so I can see some other things I know what some of these symbols mean but most of these other things we're going to change in the menu oh one more thing on here actually we can change which is the ISO so right now it's set to auto I'm just going to go ahead and put that on 1600 1600 might be too aggressive um, once we get out there we might you know bring it down to 800 or 400 but I usually start at 1600 or even higher um, because when you're just doing those test exposures to see what you have make sure things are in focus and not streaking it's nice to have a high ISO like that okay now I'm going to go ahead and hit menu here and this first uh, menu screen on a Canon uh, all the way over on the left the first thing in there is image quality I, you could also think of that as like a file format um, all of this top row here and these two on the bottom row are JPEG options um, so right now it's set on large JPEG for astrophotography you do not want JPEG you want raw you might think well why not get raw plus JPEG there's really no reason to it's just going to fill up your memory card faster and you're just going to throw out those JPEGs so just do raw that will just capture the proprietary raw files for whatever system you're using Nikon or Canon um, or Sony all of different raw uh, file endings um, but the astrophotography software that will show uh, will handle all of those I would disable any beeping or anything like that it just gets annoying under image review you want to set this to off what is image review let me show you I'll go ahead and take a picture here oh it's a 10 second picture so this is going to be just pure white but I should have said reset that okay anyways there we go that little two second review of your picture uh, is good when you're doing like you know regular photography but for astrophotography you really don't want that because for one it will ruin your uh, dark uh, adaptation of with your eyes it really sort of blind you at night um, and two it uh, will drain the battery faster three this is a minor issue but it might raise the heat of the electronics and the sensor up a little bit and with uh, without cooling it's you really want to try to keep the camera as as cool as possible um, so any anything that can raise the heat inside the camera is bad so we're going to turn that off image review off you can always just hit the playback button when you're doing some testing to see the picture so you don't need that all right let's see if there's anything in here this doesn't really matter because it applies to the JPEG transformation I believe but I just like to set the picture style to neutral again I don't think that matters color space uh, I would suggest putting this in Adobe RGB I'm not sure again if that matters but that's what I've always done long exposure noise reduction you might think that sounds good don't want that <laughs> always turn that off uh, you know some astrophotographers who try to save time uh, might disagree with me but um, I think what that will do if I turn it on is basically take a dark within the camera um, and apply that to the picture that I just took um, but all of the workflows that I'm going to be showing we take darks separately and apply the darks ourselves so I always would just recommend you leave that off high ISO speed noise reduction off 
Again, I don't know if that applies to the raw file. I think what it's saying down here is that it doesn't, but uh, let's just turn it off anyways. Basically, any uh, like thing you can turn off in here, you probably want disabled or off. Um, nothing in there really matters. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, if, um, whoops, back. If you, uh, you know, your memory card was pretty full, you might want to take the pictures off of it and then format the card. So you're starting out with a nice uh, full card. Auto rotate. Um, this, again, I would recommend turning off. Um, I've had some issues with that uh, in processing. So uh, I don't want it to rotate my pictures. I'm going to turn that off. Auto power off, you might want to turn that, disable that as well. Uh, I'm not sure uh, about that. I'm actually just going to leave it on, but put it up to eight minutes because I actually might want to save battery if uh, I'm not doing anything and I just accidentally left the camera on. Okay, I think we're done. So gone through all the settings that matter in the menu. The main thing, if you forget all of that, is just make sure you're set to record raw files. If I get out of the menu here, you can see because we switched it to raw and I'm using a fairly small memory card, um, the number of pictures we can take has gone down substantially, but that's plenty because I'm only planning to maybe do 100 pictures of Orion tonight. And even with darks and bias and everything, we should be fine. Uh, but we might almost fill the memory card once we get all those calibration frames. While I have the camera set up like this, one more thing I'd like to point out with uh, the T6i here that's really nice is it has uh, this swivel screen, which I can actually point up. So you might think, eh, who cares? But this is a huge uh, neck saver because um, when, the, when you don't have a screen that can point up like that and it's just fixed to the back of the camera, most of the time this is going to be pointed down and very low to the ground so you basically have to lay down on the ground to see it and uh, this where you can swivel out the screen and point it up and see it like that and then this is a touch screen is huge uh, in terms of ease of use with a DSLR and no computer. If you control it with the computer doesn't really matter. Uh, Backyard EOS is a nice program for that but if you're if you want no wires, you just want the DSLR there, um, I would, if you're getting a new one, get one that has a screen like that that comes out and you can swivel. So other than making sure I have all the equipment I'm going to use, that I have fresh batteries, that I understand how to use it, that the camera has the correct settings, what else do I do before I leave the house? Planning, of course. Um, I have a whole video on this, so I'll put that uh, as a link here, but um, I just want to show, since I'm showing every step of this M42 process, what I would do to plan for M42 with some basic equipment. It's not going to be super involved, but let's jump on the computer and I'll show you uh, what we can do with DSO browser to make a plan for tonight. I'm going to start uh, with this uh, free donation supported website called DSO Browser. If you are interested in this, um, how to use this website, I have uh, another video which I'll link through an annotation right here so you can find it. Um, that's all about planning for uh, DSO Im imaging sessions. And I talk a lot about this website and how to uh, set up your profile and all of that. So if you're interested, go ahead and check out that video. Today, I'm going to go right here to Orion Nebula because that's what we're going to be shooting, M42. And just point out a few things on this site that help with planning. Um, one is that right here, we can see some amateur images of it, which is nice. And uh, down there, it uh, gives us some information about how they shot it. So like. Uh, I can see this person used ISO 1600. So that might give me a clue that that might be a good ISO to use or something like that. 
All right, after looking at these amateur images, the next thing I look at up here at the top, over on the right, is the hourly altitude of the object. And this is uh, for my location that I set in here. So it knows where I'm going to be shooting tonight, and that's how it can uh, know the altitude of the object at these different times. And so if I just move my mouse over this curve, I can see at around 10.30, it's at 25 degrees. At 11.30, it's at 35 degrees. At 12.30, past midnight, it's at 40 something. So uh, one thing that you need a little experience to be aware of is when objects will get over the tree line for whatever uh, site you're going to be shooting from. And that's not something you probably know right away if you're a beginner. But generally, uh, if you're thinking tall trees, uh, 35, 40 degrees um, is about uh, where you're going to be uh, looking at. Um, but generally, tall trees, I'd say, Above 35 degrees, most object or an object will get, you know, past the tree line. That's sort of what I uh, generalize at is about 35, 40 degrees. You're going to get past any trees, um, and so for this object, that's around midnight tonight. Now you might think, so should I just not go out till like 11:30? I wouldn't advise that. It's really much easier to set up uh, as the sun is setting, um, if you can, um, if it's like a Saturday and you have all day, um, because especially when you're new to this, it's much easier to set things up in daylight rather than in the dark. Um, but then I have all of this time before I can actually shoot Orion. So what could I do during that time? Well, I could shoot a different object. I know, for instance, that uh, the Pleiades M45 is available uh, right now. Um, so I could shoot that until Orion comes up. The other thing I could do is I could shoot my calibration frames first um, because some of those take longer than others. Uh, bias and flat frames won't take very long, just a few minutes. To shoot but darks can take a while so let's say you're gonna shoot uh, Orion for two hours tonight you may want an hour or two of dark frames to calibrate the what we call the light frames the actual object you're shooting um, so I'll talk more about calibration frames later but just to say that this time up till midnight won't be wasted we can shoot another object or we could shoot uh, calibration frames but it's helpful to think about these things before you leave the house let me scroll down here over here is a nice little data sheet about the object so I can see its magnitude 4 uh, that's pretty bright even in a light polluted area you're gonna be able to see that through any kind of telescope it's uh, one and a half by one degree it's the size of it and if I keep scrolling down here this is a really useful tool built into DSO browser where I can pick from my different objectives here, my different telescopes. And tonight I'm going to be using the AstroTech 60 millimeter refractor. And I can pick from my different cameras here. I have the ZWO in there, but tonight I'm going to use a Canon. Um, and then it gives me this nice uh, reticule right here on top of DSS imagery showing me the object right here. And I can rotate that uh, reticule with this orientation slider right here. So if I wanted to do a more vertical shot, I can see how it looks like that. Or if I wanted to do really horizontal, something like that. I think I'm going to do something like this, where it's like at a little bit of an angle. Um, this right here, this bright part is Orion, and then this little part right above it is the Running Man Nebula. All right, I think that looks pretty good. And so one thing that I will sometimes do now is I'll uh, take a screenshot of this. And I'll open up that screenshot in something like Photoshop, but it could be whatever image editing program you're 
comfortable with. And I'll uh, invert it. Then it's just a little bit easier to see the star pattern. I'll maybe make it uh, grayscale because I don't really need the colors there just to see that star pattern really clearly. Um, and sometimes I'll also uh, play around with curves a little bit just to add a little bit more contrast so that those stars and the dust is really clear. So I can really see the framing now and how that's gonna look on my sensor. And then I might print this out or send it to my phone so I can look at it later when I'm doing the framing. So that's about it that we're gonna, I'm gonna do on the computer for this object. Uh, like I said, we're keeping it pretty basic today, so I'm not doing a huge amount of planning. We're doing uh, what's called a one-shot color camera, OSC, so I don't have to think about filters or anything like that. And uh, in terms of uh, a plan, I'm just gonna shoot this as long as I can. Um, I think there's gonna be some clouds coming in tonight, so I might only get, I don't know, an hour on it or something like that. Um, but we'll just shoot it as long as we can. And in terms of the amount of time to put into each sub exposure, I'm somewhat limited by my mount tonight and also the fact that uh, I'm not gonna be guiding. So uh, probably can't do really long exposures anyways. So I'm gonna try 30 seconds and then just set the ISO uh, based on what the histogram bump looks like. Um, so I'll explain all of that later um, at when we're actually doing it. But uh, that's my plan. I can print this out or send it to myself now so I have an idea of the framing and uh, we're ready to go. All right, we have a nice night here in Delaware. Uh, the moon is setting over here to the southwest and Orion is rising over there. Uh, to the southeast and um, we're about ready to get rolling here. Um, I've already set up the Ioptron tripod as you can see um, and you really when you're doing astrophotography you don't want to raise this any higher than is necessary. Um, the legs would extend and make this quite a bit higher which makes it a little bit more comfortable to use uh, but that's really just for visual use so that you're at a comfortable uh, uh, play, uh, height for the eyepiece. For astrophotography, you want to keep the center of gravity as low as possible. So that's, this is how I have it here. I'm just going to put in this tray. Okay. And I'll go ahead and make sure this is level just by using a little level on my phone here. Yep, that's pretty good. Um, I also can check that this pin right here is roughly pointed uh, north because my leveler, uh, it's part of PS Align Pro, which is a $2 app, um, also has a compass built into the leveler. So I can see that's north, which is good. All right, next step is I'm going to take out the mount head here. And with the Ioptron, when to fit it back into the case, you have to take out this bolt uh, and then put it in each time. And what this bolt does is it's the latitude, or the, sorry, the altitude adjustment. All right, got that bolt in there. I can just put this onto the tripod here. And right below uh, the mount head is the screw here to attach it and secure it to the tripod. All 
Okay, that's now securely on there. I'm now going to release the counterweight shaft right like that. And take off this piece. And on the back here, take off the cap. And there's a polar alignment scope uh, built into this. And I often like to uh, look through it before I turn the mount on, because once you turn the mount on, you usually get a pretty glaring red light. Um, but I like to sort of make sure I can see Polaris through the polar alignment scope before I turn on that red light. Um, because if it's not even in the field of view, then uh, it's hard to find Polaris with that red light on. Um, and uh, to do this, I'm gonna have to turn on the light lighting up me for a second here. So bear with me, it's gonna go dark. Okay, now that the polar alignment uh, pull master is on there, I'm gonna go ahead and install a counterweight on the counterweight shaft, just like so. And I'm not sure where on the shaft this should go yet, because you have to do that with the telescope up here so you can balance it. Um, that's good enough for now. And I'm not going to turn the mount on yet. I'm just going to get ready here by uh, putting, attaching my uh, hand controller here. And I've put some little, uh, I forget what they call these, waterproof Velcro for that just to stick on the front like that. Okay, ready for the scope. Okay, now let's go ahead and balance. All right, so see how it's, it's falling this way um, towards the counterweight. I wanna get it so that it's just slightly falling to the counterweight side, but basically balanced. This is called getting a little bit east heavy, not having quite perfect balance, but pretty close. Okay, that's good. Okay, now I'm going to do the fine polar alignment, and again, I'll have to turn off the light to do this. Uh, uh, basically, the idea here is uh, you just tell uh, the software what your uh, axis of rotation is, um, and then it looks at the patterns of the stars around Polaris, and uh, you can get a very fine polar alignment using this electronic scope and your computer. Um, but again, this is optional. Uh, another way to get a fine polar alignment is through what's called drift align, which you can look up. It's basically just watching the stars uh, drift on your DSLR and uh, fixing the polar alignment that way. All right, so I'm gonna turn off the light. Okay, now I've done a great uh, polar alignment with the pole master. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the mount on. This mount runs off uh, eight AA batteries, or it can also run off a uh, 12 volt or uh, battery, a uh, bigger battery, because uh, it has a socket here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and use this uh, 
to put in some information here. Again, I use PS Align Pro to for my GPS coordinates. So I'm setting what's called the time and sight in here. And then I click on set zero position, which just tells it it's uh, in this counterweight down, pointing at Polaris position. And now we're ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and just go to, they call it select and slew in the menu here. I'm gonna go to um, M42. And the mount starts slewing. It's going in the right direction, which is a good sign. Once it gets there, I'm gonna use this uh, Telrad, which is just a type of finder scope to center uh, M42 a little bit better before turning on the camera and doing some uh, more framing in there. All right, fortunately, I'm gonna have to turn off the light once more. Okay, uh, I've uh, centered the target using the Telrad here and uh, then I turned on my DSLR and it was right there on the LCD. Uh, and I recognize these as the stars around the Orion Nebula, but for a beginner you might not, but then all you have to do is just take like a 10 second exposure for instance. And take a look at it. And there you see Orion right there in the middle. Um, this framing looks pretty good. Let me just take a look here. Yeah, I like that. Um, sort of going sideways here with the running man up there. Let's see if I can see it without all this stuff. There we go. Maybe I'll just push it down just a tad. So, yeah, I think that's good. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna go ahead and pump this up to 30 second exposure, which is my, what I was hoping for. And just make sure I'm not uh, trailing the stars or anything. And I'll also take a look at the histogram just to show you uh, how you can evaluate uh, if you have a good exposure level. Okay, it looks super bright, but that's usually okay. Let's uh, zoom in on the stars here. Ah, what did I do? The stars look reasonably round, but it's a little bit hard to tell because we are not focused. That's something I forgot to do. So let's go ahead and focus using live view. I'm gonna zoom in. I'm going to find my focus here. And you can see when I go that way, star is getting bigger. We're seeing um, 
sort of a pattern there. When I go this way, eventually it gets bigger again, but I'm really out of focus there. So what I'm going for is trying to get that star as small as possible. And the other thing I can try here is I have a bad knob mask. This star might not be bright enough, but let's go ahead and try it. Okay, it's just bright enough that I can probably do this. It might be hard to see on your screen though there. Right there is focus. I can see the pattern of the Badenov mask and you just want to get that central spike in the middle. See that's out, that's out that way. That looks good. Just to test that, I'm gonna go ahead and take a six second exposure with the Badenov mask on. Yep, that looks good. Okay, let me zoom in further so you can see what I'm seeing here. See that? So that's good focus with the Badenov mask because that central spike is uh, right in between the other two. And I'll go ahead and take it off now and do what I was doing before, which is taking a 30 second exposure. If our stars are trailing and if this is a good exposure level. All right, let's zoom in on this guy. Ah, keep doing that. Those stars do not look like they're trailing at all, but I have a little bit of a, a streak, but that's just because I was hitting the trigger, but stars look good. Okay, let's check the level now, which I just get by hitting info here a couple times to zoom out first. There's our histogram. Uh, it's actually a little bit too far uh, over. We only want it about a quarter to a third of the way over. So I'm going to turn down my ISO uh, and try this again. Turn it down to 800. Check it again. There we go. So a quarter to a third of the way over. It looks good. Let's check our stars again. The stars look perfect, so we're ready to go. So last step here is so I'm gonna take my uh, intervalometer here. And just make sure it's set right. 31 seconds, so that gives a one second gap between them. I'm gonna take, let's say, Try for 50 shots. I don't know if we'll get that before it hits the trees, but we'll try it. Go ahead and get out a live view here. Close this up and start. All right, now we're gonna do the calibration frames. I'm gonna start by taking my flats here. You can see I have a LED panel that I use, and I also have uh, this little cap diffuser, but you can just use like a white t-shirt, that works fine. 
Um, and you don't need the white LED panel either. You could, this is just a, what's called a tracing panel I got on Amazon, but you could uh, instead use like a iPad or a laptop screen uh, turned to white. I'm gonna put that on top here. And that's about it in terms of setup. Just you just want something white uh, and diffuse and uh, filling the entire uh, field of the scope. And so you can either use a screen like this on top, or you could shoot sky flats, just pointing at the sky with some kind of diffusion, or even just like a white wall that's evenly uh, lit. Um, so let's look at the back of the camera here so we can see the settings for flats. Um, basically, I just use the same ISO that I'm going to use for uh, my um, lights. Uh, and then I just sort of experiment with different uh, exposure length uh, settings here, or also called shutter speed on a DSLR, until my flat is about uh, half of the way over. It doesn't have to really be quite half because... Um, I won't get into it, but this is a JPEG histogram. It's not the raw histogram. So really, if you undershoot a little bit, that that's just fine. Um, and some people do this with aperture priority. That's another option for taking flats. And I'm going to take about 50 of them. Okay, for the next uh, group of calibration frames, we want the front uh, lens cap on. So I'm just going to put that on here because these are both uh, done in darkness. And uh, really all you have to do is just put that lens cap on. You also want to make sure that uh, you're at around the same temperature as uh, where what you're shooting your lights at. So we've been out here a while. I've let the, the scope and the uh, camera uh, cool down. It's mostly that the sensor that you're worried about being at the same temperature. So let's start with bias frames. Those are really easy and quick to do. We'll look at the camera here, and all we have to do on the camera is turn the shutter speed all the way up. By that I mean the fastest that it can go. So in this DSLR, that's one four thousandths of a second. Um, it might be different on your DSLR, it might be one eight thousandths of a second. But the point here is you just want a very, very short exposure. Um, and this is going to reveal what's called the fixed pattern noise on the camera sensor. I'm going to use my intervalometer here to take a bunch of them. With bias frames, I usually take at least 100, if not more, um, to really get a nice uh, idea of that noise that's uh, fixed to the sensor and uh, finding those banding patterns and things like that. You really want a, a lot to average together. So I'm going to uh, type in um, 100 here and uh, let it go. Okay, and for our last calibration frames, the only thing we have to change here is the shutter speed. These are darks, and we're just going to change the shutter speed to what the same shutter speed that we're going to use for our lights, in which, in my case, I've already decided on 30 seconds. So I'm going to change it to 30 seconds here. Um, and the number of darks you're going to take, uh, it's always more the better, but uh, usually you don't have to take, uh, you know, more than 30 or 50 or something like that with 30 second darks i might as well take a bunch but um if you were doing like five minutes of exposures that could take a long time so usually around 20 or 30 is uh is fine um and the only other thing with darks is you just want to try to match that temperature as well as you can so if you think that it's going to keep dropping in temperature you would want to do them closer to when you shoot the lights so that that temperature stays stable all right, I'm gonna let this go and take about 30.
Okay, first thing you're gonna wanna do after you've uh, had a successful night of imaging is get all of your files off of your DSLR and onto your computer. And I like to put everything in one folder. So you can see I've started a folder here for this project. And then I organize things uh, like this. Uh, I put my bias, my darks, my flats, my lights all into their own folders. And then I have a new folder for processing files. Um, and so I've already taken the files off of the camera and put them into the appropriate folders here. Um, but um, I think it's interesting to look at what these files look like on their own before we do anything with them. So let's take a look. Um, if you have any kind of uh, raw processing software on your computer, you should be able to just double click one of these to open it up, um, like Adobe products or raw table or dark table or there's a bunch of GIMP. There's a bunch of different uh, programs you can use to look at these. Um, I'm just going to use whatever comes up here, probably Photoshop, to look at these different files. Okay, so this is uh, Photoshop, uh, Camera Raw, Adobe Camera Raw. It recognizes the DSLR that this was shot with, which was again a T6i. It recognizes that this uh, it was shot at one four thousandths of a second, uh, so that's a bias frame, ISO 800. Um, and all I want to show you here is what this looks like in this state. It doesn't look like much at all, but if I really just stretch the exposure here, you can see that uh, there is a lot of uh, noise here and also these sort of uh, alternating dark uh, and bright lines. That is the fixed pattern noise on the sensor. And we want to subtract that out of our flats, uh, especially. Um, it would also be included in the dark frames. Um, so uh, the point is really to calibrate your flats properly because your darks are going to be exposed for your lights um, while these bias frames can be used to take this pattern noise out of my flats. So I'm not adding noise when I divide the flats out. Okay, so that's what those look like. Let's go ahead and open up a dark. It's gonna look pretty similar. <laughs> I'll stretch it here with this little exposure guy. And like I said, it looks very similar if we really stretch it out. Um, these bright pixels are hot pixels. Um, you can see that it has that same fixed pattern noise, the horizontal banding of the bias frame. Um, and this is to handle dark current noise uh, in our lights. Um, so since I was using an uncooled camera, uh, there's going to be some heat buildup on the sensor, and this is to calibrate that out. And let's look at a light frame. Oh, sorry, flat. So this is the last calibration frame. And it's really important. A lot of people forget to shoot them. Um, let me just mess around with this a little bit to sort of show you what this does. Okay, so it might be hard to see. Let me just accentuate it a little bit further. I don't know if that helps. What this does is it's trying to model uh, vignetting in the system. So uh, vignetting is where the corners are darker than the middle because they're not receiving as much light. Um, and so this looks like a pretty flat frame already. I was trying to accentuate there we go. There you can see once we stack them, it'll look a little bit more like this probably where the middle part is getting more light than the corners, uh, which are darker. Um, and so that's what this is trying to model. It can also, if there's any dust or what we call dust donuts in your system, like uh, dust falling anywhere in the optical train, it can also model those and uh, divide those out. Um, so flats are very important to take. This is an example of what one looks like. Um, and not much else to say about that. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel, open up a light. And lights are your pictures of the actual object. And I think we did about 70 of them here at 30 seconds each. 
And so this is what a single light frame looks like. Um, this is with an auto stretch, uh, what's called a gamma curve applied. Um, but uh, so without anything done to it, this is what a light frame looks like. If I play around with these sliders a little bit, uh, let me bring up the exposure, bring down the black level, bring down the contrast, bring down the highlights a little bit, bring up the clarity, change the temperature just a little bit here. This is about how much uh, detail we get from a single um, exposure. And it's very hard to see, but you can see in a single exposure here, we do get some of the outer nebulosity, but that will show up a lot more when we stack. You can see in a single exposure, we don't see much of the running man here. Um, but again, after we stack 70 of these, a lot of that will become clearer because right now it's lost in the noise and it's also lost in uh, the light pollution gradient here. Um, but you can see in a single exposure, we do get um, some nice detail. And uh, the other thing we, we would do when looking through these single exposures is uh, reviewing that each one um, is doesn't have any mistakes in it like uh, that the stars are reasonably round and in focus um, in this light after I've messed with a little bit here you can see the vignetting on the corners so again that's what the flats are supposed to take out so we can use more of the frame um, all right that's it uh, I'm gonna cancel out of that so that's our four different frames um, once we have these all sorted like this on our computer, we can move on to the next step in processing, which is calibrating our lights, stacking our lights um, after registering them to each other using the stars to register. Um, and we're gonna look at some different processing methods to do that. Uh, we can try Deep Sky Stacker and Photoshop or GIMP, and then we can also look at it, how to do it in PixInsight. Okay, here we go with the Deep Sky Stacker. This uh, program is Windows only, but it is free. And what it does is it registers your uh, light frames. It calibrates them with darks, flats, and bias files. And it stacks all of that together and can do things like Sigma clipping to uh, get rid of things that are abnormal like uh, hot pixels and, and just uh, airplane streaks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a very easy to use program once you get the hang of it. Um, it does this one thing very well, which is stacking and doesn't do much else. Um, so let's look at it. We're just gonna use the basic features of it here. We start over here in the upper left-hand corner by clicking open picture files. I'm gonna click on that and find uh, the light frames for the object that I'm working with. So if you've already organized like I have here, it's pretty easy. You just go into the M42 folder, click on the lights folder, and there's all the files. If on your computer you are not seeing your files for some reason, just make sure that down here it's not set to something weird like JPEG only or picture files, it's set to just all files, and then you should see all of your raw files. I'm just gonna click on one and then press Control A to select them all, and then click Open. Okay, um, what I can do here in Deep Sky Stacker is click on one, I'm just gonna click on the first one, and it gives me a nice little preview here of the file. We're not seeing much uh, other than the really bright stars here. Um, if we zoom in, we can see that there are dimmer stars as well. But if I wanted to brighten this picture up a bit, this is just for preview purposes. I can go up here to the upper right and drag this middle slider in a bit to the left. And it brightens up the picture some, and I can see some of the dimmer stars now, which is helpful for evaluating uh, focus um, and uh, also how... Uh, much elongation of the stars there are in, in every frame. 
Deep Sky Stacker can do some stuff with evaluating the stars for you, um, but if you want this more manual control, it's here for you. You can zoom in, you can look at the pictures, you can go through them one by one. It takes a second for it to load each picture. You can zoom in on this one. And I can decide, is this a frame that I wanna keep or do I wanna get rid of it? Um, and I'm not gonna show that whole process, but I'll just show you uh, an example of a frame that you would not want to include. Let me go all the way down to the bottom here. And I remember at the end of the night, my last frame, I must've hit the tripod because there's like a little jitter in it. So let me zoom in on this. Okay, and you see that? That's on all of the stars, that little jitter on all the stars. That's from knocking something or stepping too hard or whatever. And uh, it, can, it can also happen from wind, um, but basically we wouldn't want to include that frame. So how do we not include this frame? What we wanna do is we first wanna check all. So I'm gonna go over here and click check all. And then I'm going to just uncheck that last one, that one I don't want to include, just by clicking its little checkbox here to uncheck it. Okay, so we have 71 of 72 light frames checked. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our dark frames. Click on dark files over here. I'm gonna hit Control A to select all my darks, add those. If we look at one of those, I'm just gonna click on one here. It doesn't look like much. If we really stretch it. Still doesn't look like much. But that's what darks are. Uh, they're basically just correcting for hot pixels and thermal noise, things like that. Let's go ahead and add our flat files. Control A to select all of these, click open. Brings in our flats. Let me stretch this a little bit so we can see what it looks like too much. There we go. So you can see that it gets a little bit darker towards the corners here. That's representing uh, the vignetting. I don't know how clearly you can see that, but that's our flat frames. And last, our bias frames. Let's add these. Control A to select them. And we have 100 bias frames in here. Let's see if we can see anything in the bias. Eh, sort of hard to see anything. But basically that uh, represents the fixed pattern noise on the sensor and it can get rid of uh, horizontal and vertical banding problems that is common with DSLRs. Okay, so we have all of this added now. And remember with that last light frame, I unchecked it looks good if we want we can look at the raw settings uh, which are down here under options raw settings and these are the same as the last time i set them up uh, i just use this default bear matrix interpolation uh, i've always used camera white balance because i'm always careful to set that if you didn't just uncheck that to not use it at all I always set the black point to zero, uh, which helps with calibration, I believe. And if you change any of these, just remember to click apply before you click okay. Next thing we're gonna do is over here on the left-hand side under registering and stacking, click on register checked pictures. And it brings up your register settings. These will be whatever you last set them at. Um, so, if you want it to automatically detect and remove hot pixels, make sure just to check that. I'm gonna do that. 
Uh, if you've already registered the pictures, you can use this option right above there, but I haven't registered these together yet, meaning putting them all in the same place so the stars match up. So I'm gonna leave that unchecked. I wanna check stack after registering because I do want that to happen. And right here it says select the best percentage pictures and stack them. You can change this to whatever you want. Basically, it just assigns a score to each picture uh, based on how round the stars are. And if you only wanted to include like the best 50% or 80%, you can set that right here. If you want to include everything, just put in 100%. I'm going to put in 97% because maybe there's one that I didn't catch that it could throw out. Um, next thing I do is I go over here to the advanced tab and by default it sets this star detection threshold to 10%. Um, you may need to change this though to get uh, a good number of stars. If you're below let's say 50 stars you'd probably want to um, change the detection. If you're above a thousand stars you might also want to change that detection because then it might be picking up hot pixels and things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and click on compute the number of detected stars. It looks at the first light frame and sees how many stars it can find. Looks like I have plenty here. It found almost 300, so that's fine. I could just leave this alone at 10%, but if I wanted to uh, speed this up a little bit, I might Take this down to 20%, I'll compute again. And now it's down to 177 stars. So uh, it's just f fewer stars to match against. Um, usually works a little bit faster and better. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this reduce the noise by using a median filter. And then I'm gonna click on recommended settings. And basically you can just step through this and anytime where it's uh, highlighted in blue here, you can read what it says. If you are using a modded DSLR, well I'm not, so I'm gonna ignore that. If you are processing narrowband images, I'm not, so I'm gonna ignore that one. And then you just go through each one and if it's something that you haven't done, you can just click on that and it will put that into your recommended settings. I'm using Sigma clipping, I'm using bilinear deburying, and blah blah blah. So you can go through there, make sure you have all the recommended settings, click OK. If you want to go into stacking parameters and look at these, this has much more detail. I'm not going to go into all of this right now because uh, this isn't a video about Deep Sky Stacker. It's sort of an overview of all the processing, so this would take too long. But there are other videos online, so if you're interested, you can learn about all these different settings in here. This is good enough, though. We're going to go ahead and click OK. And it gives us a nice summary here of everything. We're going to be stacking 72 light frames uh, with offset or bias, dark, and flats specifically 100 bias, 25 darks, and 29 flats. The total exposure is 38 minutes, 24 seconds. All looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and click OK to start the process. And off it goes. It starts by stacking together all of your bias or offset frames into a master bias. It then does the same thing for darks and flats. It then calibrates all your individual light frames with those master calibration frames, and then registers and stacks your light frames into your final single integrated image, um, which you can then preview here in Deep Sky Stacker, um, but usually you just save it off and we move on to Photoshop or GIMP. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to speed up this part of the video because it's going to take at least 10 minutes, probably more like uh, 15 or 20, and uh, then we'll, uh, I'll show you saving out of Deep Sky Stacker when this is all done.
Okay, so what it's doing right now is it's saving the autosave.tiff file to my lights folder. This is important. This is a 32-bit uh, TIFF file that you can consider your master stack. Uh, Photoshop can actually read a 32-bit uh, TIFF file, so you could bring it right into the autosave.tiff right into Photoshop. Um, not all features in Photoshop are 32-bit, so you might have to eventually convert it to a 16-bit file. If you're going to be working with GIMP, it probably can't even open that 32-bit file. So we're going to have to first uh, save the picture to file, which is over here on the left-hand side under processing, and save it as an uncompressed 16-bit TIFF. Um, one thing that's a little bit confusing here about Deep Sky Stacker is it's making the final picture right here on screen and there's a bunch of uh, settings we could change right here in Deep Sky Stacker um, but it's not really meant as a processing program it's just a stacking program so really there's uh, not much point in doing much here because we're not going to save these changes anyways so I'm just going to leave all of that alone um, and go over here to where it says save picture to file and I'll just save it here to my desktop to my M42 folder and I'll call it uh, stack tiff and I'm going to say compression none and I want to just leave this option that says embed adjustments in the saved image but do not apply them uh, checked so basically just exactly how it was and click save <music> Okay, now that I have a stacked image out of Deep Sky Stacker, I've moved on to Photoshop here. Uh, everything I'm going to show today it really shouldn't matter which version of Photoshop you have. I'm just using the latest here, but it, I've used uh, the previous versions, CS6, CS5, CS4. They all work pretty much the same. Um, and we're going to start by opening up our stacked TIFF out of Deep Sky Stacker. So we're going to go up here to the File menu and choose Open and find it here on the computer and open it up and it looks something like that uh, it looks like not very impressive right like uh, we didn't capture much it looks worse than maybe even just the individual uh, files at this point um, but this is actually exactly what we want what we took out of deep sky stacker is the linear uh, master so basically linear it means the same thing as unstretched because we want to do the stretching here in Photoshop uh, the other thing I'll point out is that I saved this as a 16-bit TIFF and we can double check that right here by going to image mode and see that this is an RGB color and that it's 16 bits per channel if I zoom in on the center here it is interesting to see that there's a lot of fine detail right in the core of Orion there, even in this sort of quasi-linear state. Um, what that means is that uh, once we get further into processing, this is going to get completely blown out to keep the rest, you know, to bring up the rest of the picture. Um, but we don't want to lose that. We're going to bring it in later. So the first thing that I always do in Photoshop here is I duplicate this layer a couple times. And in Photoshop, it's easy to do that. You just right click or control click if you're on a laptop and choose duplicate layer. And you can call it something if you want. I'm just gonna call mine uh, first stretch. And as long as we do that first and we keep this background layer as it is, then we're good. Uh, Cause we can keep duplicating off the background layer as needed. So with this first stretch layer selected, I'm going to go up here to Image, go down to Adjustments, and go to Levels. Um, since we're going to be coming back to this a few times, uh, it's good to learn the keyboard shortcut, which in this case is Command-L on Mac or Control-L on Windows. And here's our Levels adjustment. Uh, this is uh, what you're going to use to First, apply a little bit of stretch to this, um, and 
you can see that the uh, histogram peak here is very um, compressed and what we want to do is sort of spread it out and um, keep uh, moving it off the left hand side here and then bringing it back to the left hand side and the way we do that is we take this middle slider and we move it over here to the left towards where uh, the end of the peak is there and you can see as we do that I'm going to zoom in again we get a lot more detail coming up here in the Orion Nebula and a lot more stars start to appear. Now we want to do this in um, a bunch of successive times. We don't want to just sort of do it all at once. Um, so I'm just actually going to sort of do mid like that and say OK. And then I'm just going to keep doing that. Press Command L, bring it up a little bit more and just slowly stretch it out like this. Now, eventually, when the sky background gets quite bright and we're sort of losing any detail that we're bringing in, what I like to do is take this shadow slider, this one over here on the left, and drag that one to the edge right here. And it's going to sort of look like your you know resetting everything you just did but you really are you really have uh, applied some stretch here just to prove the point to you if I turn off this first stretch with a little eyeball indicator over here in the layers you can see we've done a fair amount of stretching you can see M43 is coming in right there the arms of Orion are coming in Okay, but we're going to keep going with this stretch, so I'm just going to press Command L one more time here. I'm going to stretch this again. Press Command L again. Stretch it a little bit more. Command L, and then I'm going to bring this shadow slider over again. And I like to just keep looking at what it's doing. And you can see that these uh, the nebula is getting more and more sort of in focus. Uh, we can see more of it. And we can see this dark nebula coming in here now. It's pretty cool. But I'm just going to keep going with this just a couple more times. Bring the, the, the left-hand slider over to sort of the edge of these histogram peaks and bring this one in a little bit. Okay, at this point, um, this is stretched enough. I can start seeing that uh, outer nebulosity out here on the Orion Nebula. Um, and the fainter Running Man is also coming into view. And what is clear at this point is that we have a fairly um, regular light pollution gradient where it's darker up here at the top and brighter down here at the bottom. And there are some plugins that are really good at dealing with this. There's one called, uh, I think, Astroflat Pro, and there's another one called Gradient Exterminator. But um, I'm not going to show those, uh, partly because they both cost about 30 to $50, so um, I'm not going to make you go buy something right away. I'll show you a way to do it just with Photoshop's tools here. It's not quite as effective as those plugins, but it works okay. So. What we're doing here is we want to remove this sky gradient. Um, the light pollution uh, is uh, coming from the bottom of the frame here, so that's why it's brighter at the bottom. And then the other thing you'll see here is that it's it's fairly red. Um, that's because of uh, when light pollution hits the atmosphere, it, it creates this sort of reddish sky glow. Uh, if you're in a very dark place, you might see a more greenish uh, sky glow, but in light polluted place, Without any kind of light pollution filter, your images will probably come back fairly reddish like this. Um, in any case, what we want to do is we want to subtract it out of the picture, leaving us just with a dark night sky and the stars and the nebula. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and copy this layer. Actually, no, let's duplicate it. So I'm going to right-click, choose Duplicate, 
and I'm going to call this my background removal layer. Okay, and then I'm going to copy it. So in newer versions of Photoshop, you just go edit copy and that copies the layer you have selected. If you have an older version of Photoshop, you first have to select this, just do command A to make a selection and then you'll be able to edit copy. Um, then go ahead and do file new and it should put in here for the width and height, whatever the dimensions of are the thing that you just put on the clipboard. So that's good. We can call this background and go ahead and paste it in. Over here in the layers panel, we don't actually need this white background layer, so I'm just going to delete it. And what we wanna do with this is completely get rid of all of the stars and the nebula because we're just trying to model the background so we can come back here and remove the background. Um, so to do that, first I'm gonna get rid of the stars. The way to do that is through a filter so if you go up here to the menus at the top and go to the filter menu and go down to noise and then choose from the noise menu, dust and scratches. And you can see I've already set mine here to something that works, but basically you're just gonna take these two sliders and move them around so that for your picture, whatever the radius and the threshold are set to, it's getting rid of all of the stars. Now, if you find that like here, it's not getting rid of the halo of that brightest star, that's okay, because we can take care of that the same way that we took care of the nebula here. But what you do wanna do is set this so that for all these medium and small stars, it's just completely blurring those out into the background. This looks good for this particular setup. Um, I'm at 58 pixel radius and three levels under threshold. I'm gonna click OK to apply that. Takes a second. And by the way, don't worry about if it's doing something weird along the edges or the corners, because later on in processing, we're gonna crop those out anyways. Um, that's normal. What we're gonna do now, though, is we wanna get rid of this, uh, the remnant of the nebula here. So I'm going to grab, what is it called? Spot Healing Brush Tool. If you don't have Spot Healing Brush Tool in your version of Photoshop, Healing Brush Tool same, does the same thing. Um, on my version, it looks sort of like a little Band-Aid. Um, and what I wanna do with this is I wanna set the size to be fairly big, uh, so I can just do this quickly. So I'm gonna set mine to around 500 pixels. It doesn't have to be a particularly hard brush. I could set that to a low hardness. And I wanna make sure that it's set to the content aware type. Um, and then I'm just going to brush over anywhere that there is nebula. And you might have to do it in a couple passes here, but it should go pretty quick. You'll be able to get rid of all of that uh, nebulosity that's in the background there. And I usually start out sort of broad with this and then fix smaller little issues. But usually, don't really have to change the brush size, I just sort of, okay, that looks good enough to me. Um, basically, this is what uh, in PixInsight we would call creating a background model. Um, and this is how you do it in Photoshop. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Just press Command S. Control S on Windows. And it's saving as background.psd, that's fine. Then I'm gonna go back to my main picture here. 
And with this background removal layer selected, I'm gonna go up here to image, go down to apply image. And for the source, I want background. For the channel RGB, that's fine. For blending, I want to go down to subtract. And then um, you'll probably find that you have an offset here of zero. Try different numbers there until you basically get um, a fairly grayish appearance. Uh, the colors aren't gonna be perfect yet, but what you wanna do is sort of get this mm, mid-gray sky. Um, so for my camera here, that was an offset of 50. You see that if I put it at 30, that's a little too dark. 20, darker still. Zero is obviously too dark. I've lost a lot of that nebulosity that I brought up previously in the stretch. So 50 looks good to me. I can see a lot of the detail that I brought out there in the stretch. Um, the other thing you can try here is you can change the opacity from 100 to something lower. So for instance, 90 and see if it's still removing the background well enough uh, with a lower opacity uh, setting. 80, see now at 80, I'm seeing a lot of that red come back. So I'm gonna set it to 90 here. And the reason I'm seeing anything as I'm changing these numbers is because preview is turned on. If, if when you're changing these, you're not seeing anything, just make sure that right there you have preview turned on. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and click OK. And just doing those couple steps, stretching and removing the background have already uh, made the picture a lot better. Um, we can see what the background removal did by just turning off the visibility of it over here in the layers panel. So that was before with that red background and it had a strong gradient top to bottom and here's after removing it. Okay, so next uh, what I can do is continue working um, basically on setting the levels of this image. Um, we can see now that there is a lot of interesting detail in here. Um, there's a lot of cool dark nebula um, there and even there. Um, there's M43, this little piece up here that was not visible before. You get this really nice uh, blue and red, um, but it's a little bit dim at this point, a little bit unsaturated. The running man's barely showing up. The challenge here is we wanna continue stretching this, continue bringing out the nebula, but we don't want the stars to get too big. Um, so there's different ways uh, we can do this. We can attack this with uh, masks, um, but usually I just like to do a little bit of stretching before I uh, go to masks. Um, but since this is a good sort of starting place, I'm gonna duplicate again. So I'm gonna do duplicate layer, and I'm gonna call this one um, experiment. All right, and for my experiment, I'm gonna go ahead and instead of going to image adjustments levels, I'm gonna this time go to curves. And curves is just slightly different from levels. Um, in addition to changing the brightness, you can go into the individual color channels, which is useful, um, and change the levels that way. Um, and then it also just, is a different feel since it changes things um, instead of sort of more uniformly, it puts a curve in there. So it's it, you can see that with this curve, it's gonna bring these tones right here up more than these ones and more than these ones. Um, 
when you, whenever you take a point in the middle and bring it out like this, that's going to always sort of add contrast. If you take another point and you bring it down like that and make this sort of S shape, that's going to really add contrast um, because basically you're saying bring the background sky level down and bring the stars and the nebula up. So that's really going to create a lot of contrast in the image and it already looks a lot better. Um, but we have to be careful with this because if I turn the preview off and on here, you can see we're losing a lot of detail there in the middle. But the nice thing is if I turn the preview off and on and we look up here, we're gaining detail up there by increasing the contrast. So there's a lot of trade-offs when you're processing um, astrophotography, especially objects like the Orion Nebula, where it has a very bright core and much dimmer outer parts. Um, and the way that I uh, typically deal with this is instead of trying to create a really nicely feathered mask uh, in Photoshop, I'm just going to go ahead and accept that the bright, the center part is going to get really too bright here. And then I'm going to come back in to this background layer that I've saved. Let me just show you that again. And I'm going to restore detail using my original picture. Uh, this is sometimes called an uh, HDR approach, a high dynamic range approach. One thing that a lot of people think is that you need, uh, you know, different length uh, pictures, uh, 10 second, 30 second, two minutes, five minutes to make an HDR approach image. You can actually do it with all the same sub exposure length um, and it often works out pretty well. Um, with this particular mount, I wasn't going to be able to go to five minute sub exposures anyways. If I could, that it would make that my job a lot easier because I would see a lot more of this faint detail out here. But in any case, I'm getting sort of off topic. Um, what we are doing here with this experiment is just sort of seeing how much we captured. So let me go back into that curves. And I'm just going to do a really, really dramatic curve here just by bringing this uh, point all the way to the edge and then taking this shadow point and dropping it down there. Okay, and this is useful just because we can see uh, that we did capture some of this outer nebulosity, but to bring it out um, from the sky background, it's going to be pretty noisy, right? See all that noise when we really take this faint part and stretch it like this? Um, but it might be worth it for the image. Let's zoom all the way out and see what it looks like. Like that looks pretty cool, I think. I like how uh, that adds something to the image. And it really, to see more of the extent of the running man, I think, and how they're even sort of connected here uh, really adds a lot too. So how do we incorporate this? Let me go ahead and just accept this curves and say, okay. And I'm gonna do that curves again and bring my black point back over. Say okay. And the problem here is a couple things. Uh, one is that we made our stars really ugly. Um, it made them really bloated and, and bright white. Um, and the other thing is obviously it completely blew out the core. Um, and it brought up some detail, which I'm not sure uh, is really worthy yet because it's just so faint. Um, a lot of people try to preserve this dust, but remember this is only 30 minutes of total exposure. So uh, I probably would just clip that down into the sky because it really is never going to add much to the picture. But maybe I do want to keep some of this outer part of the nebulosity and I like how that looks over there too. So how do I do that? Um, 
Well, first thing is I wanna get rid of the stars in this image. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do the same thing we did before, which is go to filter, noise, dust and scratches. But if I just leave it on that setting, you can see that it completely blurs the, uh, the nebulosity. We can see where it is, but it doesn't look very good. We don't retain any of that sharpness in it. So what I want to do is I want to bring this threshold level way up here to a point where it is basically capturing the star cores I'm just gonna play around with these a little bit. But leaving this fine detail in the nebula alone, okay? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. And if we have some star cores that are not, like that really, really bright star right there is, uh, is still in there, that's fine. We can clone stamp that out later. Don't worry about it, but all these major large stars, all that's left is a little bit of the halo around them, that's good. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. And then we're gonna do that a couple more times, each time bringing down that dust and scratches uh, filter values a little bit. So I'm gonna go back to noise, dust and scratches, bring down the radius, and the threshold. And you'll see that each time we do that, it cuts a little bit more of that stellar halo away, leaving though these fine details in the nebula. Go back, filter, noise, dust and scratches. Can hear my computer fan going here because uh, this is a fairly intensive process it's doing. Bring it down this time to 25, bring the threshold down to like 50. Filter, noise, dust and scratches, bring it down to 19, bring the threshold down to 30 something. And I'm not uh, picking particular values here. I'm just sort of doing this by eye and bringing it down, you know, about 10 and 15 each time. And you can see at this point, we've gotten rid of most of the stars in the background, um, but the nebula still looks pretty detailed. Um, I'm gonna do it one more time here, or maybe two more times. Hmm, maybe not actually, let me just see. Yeah, at a certain point you get diminishing returns here. I'm gonna cancel that one. All right, so we still have a few problems here though, um, a few areas where the star halos have been left. Um, so to get rid of those, we're just gonna use our spot healing brush that we used before, but this time we don't want it to be much bigger than the star halo itself. And basically I'm just getting rid of these brighter star halos.
Okay. And it doesn't look so good, but the point of this was really just to get some of this outer nebulosity. We're going to come back in and restore detail to everything in here and in here where we lost um, some detail, but it's really just to get this outer nebulosity and then restore it within a picture where we have the smaller stars. And the way we're going to do that, just as a test here, let me go ahead and move the experiment layer down one. And I'm going to go ahead and just take this, uh, and actually, before I do that, let me fix the background here, because this is very uh, reddish. Uh, and we're really seeing that gradient again. So let me just go ahead and go back into image, apply image, and yeah, let's subtract again. This time I'll do an opacity of, let's say, 70. Looks good. And now I'll just reset my black point image, adjustments, curves, take this one, and bring it over here. Okay, so that's good. It looks pretty good for like the outer nebulosity here and uh, the sky background level is good again. Let me just check this background removal layer. That's fine. Uh, well, actually, let me just move the dark. I realized that we haven't done much with the stretching here because um, this was at an earlier stage. So. Let me just duplicate this one more time. I'm going to call it uh, initial. I'll rename my experiment uh, outer neb. Okay, with my initial, I want to go ahead and open up curves and reset the black point here and also just bring it up a little bit. something like that. I don't want to stretch this too far because I want good stars. Um, okay, but that looks pretty good. Um, and I'm going to take that initial and I'm actually going to move it above the outer nab layer. Just drag it up and turn it to the screen blend mode. And what that does is it basically um, let me show you before and after. So here's normal blend mode where it's just showing what's on top here at 100% opacity. If I change it to screen blend mode, any of the darker parts in this image go to a lower opacity and the outer neb can come through. Now, by doing that, it brought the sort of the overall black point um, back up to a light gray. So I would want to once again open up curves and apply it. But remember, every time we've been doing curves up to this point, it's been just applying to the, the uh, one layer. We don't wanna do that on a layer that we've blended um, because that's going to screw things up. So instead, we wanna add what's called an adjustment layer. I think Photoshop added these in like CS3 or CS4. Um, and so up here, right above the layers panel, just choose adjustments click on a curves adjustment layer and it comes in here and basically then it just applies to everything below it. Um, so if you have any blended layers, it's also going to apply to the ones below. And I'm just going to reset my black point here a little bit. There. Okay, so this is looking pretty cool now, but we have one big problem, which is our blown out core and M43 is even blown out now. So to do deal with that, um, we need to paste in um, another stretch. I'm gonna go back here to my background layer and I'm gonna duplicate it. And I'm gonna call that duplicate layer um, core. And I'm going to take that core and I'm going to bring it back up all the way above the curves here. And let's just apply a light stretch to this. Command L. Just the same way we were doing it before. Okay. 
And then I'll just do a little curves here. I'm gonna zoom in. I want to see, uh, you know, a fair amount of detail here in M43 and in the core, but also I don't want it so dim that it's just going to look fake. Yeah, I think something like that. Uh, of course, this is very red because we haven't uh, subtracted that background let, so let me do that. Image, apply image, subtract at 70%, that's fine, okay. Okay, so now we have just a nice little um, layer that's really just focusing on the core here. And what we're gonna do is um, basically paint that back into our crazy blown out version. Now the problem is, another problem that we have now is that our crazy blown out version is way noisier than our core version here, which we haven't stretched as much um, because we're bringing out that really, really faint detail here in our crazy stretched version. Um, so what I like to do to sort of make them mesh a little bit at this point is apply some noise to this one. I know that sounds crazy to apply noise, but basically it's just gonna help us mesh these two better. Uh, some of these things that I'm talking about are not necessarily best practices. They're really just uh, what we're doing because we only have 40 minutes of data here um, to make it look as good as it can. Um, so anyways, go up here to filter. We're gonna go down to noise and click add noise. And basically just play around with this amount until it looks somewhat like that layer below. Unfortunately, we can't see that layer below while we're doing this, but um, I think something around 7% looks about right there. Okay, I'm gonna apply that, added noise. And then I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go back here and just sort of see where do I have to paint this in? And it's basically this whole area right there and that right there. And I'm gonna start uh, by adding a layer mask, uh, which is down here at the bottom of the layers panel. It's this little white square with a re uh, black circle in it. And I'm gonna click that and it adds a layer mask to this core layer. Right now it's completely white, meaning that this is completely showing but if I fill that mask, edit fill with black, now we're seeing nothing in that layer, right? And we're seeing just everything below. So then we're gonna start painting in the core here with a nice soft white brush. So go ahead and go to your brush tool, pick a nice big, completely soft round brush be a little bit bigger, something like that, and turn the opacity way, way down. I'm gonna turn it down to uh, 18%. Make sure that the mode is set to normal. And you're basically then gonna start painting in. Okay, and at first it's not gonna look that good. Um, even though we're getting back a lot of the core details here, we have this weird sort of transitionary period where it's sort of this uh, mid gray. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and duplicate this core layer. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the layer mask here on this one. Oops. Delete layer mask. Okay, and I'm gonna basically brighten up this area in this one to sort of uh, transition this in. So I'm gonna go back here to my curves, do something like that. And once again, I'll subtract that redness from it. 
image apply image okay and I'll again apply a layer mask turn it black just edit fill fill with black and again I'm going to paint with white to transition in the core. Okay, let me zoom back out and see how that looks. Okay, it's starting to look okay, decent. Um, I'm not happy with the colors yet. They're very sort of like uh, pastel, uh, too a little too bright, a little too not vibrant enough. So now we're gonna uh, work with some um, adjustments. Um, our uh, layers panel, we want to keep uh, fairly neat. So one thing I do at this point is probably just group everything here. And uh, you can do Command G. Oh, I can't do that on the background layer. I'll leave that one alone. Do Command G on all of those and just call this initial stretch and HDR. And then I'll um, press, let's see, on Mac, this is Command Option Shift E. Um, on Windows, I think this would be Control Option Shift E. Um, and basically what this does is it basically just makes a copy of exactly what you're seeing on screen, but as a new layer. And so I'm gonna call this um, starting point. And we could at this point apply uh, image adjustments this way to that starting point layer. If you like working that way, that's fine. I'm gonna use uh, adjustment layers just because I feel like they're a little bit more you know, adjustable down the line uh, if I change my mind about something. And I'm gonna start by just um, doing another curves adjustment here and resetting my black point a little bit darker there and also just bringing this up just a tad something like that um, let's go ahead and add some saturation to this picture now so go back here to adjustments go to hue slash saturation bring it up a bit now if you do it too much you just get this wildly ugly too saturated picture, too little, and it just, you know, looks sort of boring. So you just sort of don't try to want to fight, find that right amount. The other thing we can do is, uh, if this image is looking just sort of too blue, I think, um, I can try selective color and bring the cyan down in the reds. Go to the magentas and bring up the magenta and the yellow a little bit and bring down the cyan. And what really works here in the um, selective color is this neutrals thing. And you can see by bringing down the cyan here, it really changes the nebula quite a bit, but it also changes the sky background, but we can Reset that in the blacks. So this is maybe a little too much. You can see just fairly subtle adjustments. Minus 8, plus 7, plus 3 really change the appearance here. If I turn that off and on, I like that better. Um, I'm going to go here into blacks now, though, and reset this. We need cyan up a bit. There we go. OK, anyways, um, I'm going to call this done. The only thing we have left to do is uh, crop off the edges. Um, you can see if I zoom in on the edges here, there's a number of problems with them. Um, this is just a stacking artifact. Basically, all your pictures are going to be in a slightly different 
uh, placed in the sky. And so you get this little edge effect right here that you definitely want to crop off. And then when I was doing that stuff with uh, removing the background, it also did this weird thing in the corners. So um, I'm just going to grab my cropping tool here and drag in from the corners until I'm inside of that region where I'm seeing the stacking artifact and do the same thing down here at the bottom. And over here on the left, zoom back out, looks good. Hit enter, accept the crop. And now I'm just gonna look away from my monitor. I'm gonna make this full screen, look back at it and it's still, it now just seems to me that uh, it's just a little bit, uh, the, the sky background is just a little bit too bright still. If you want to try to evaluate this with uh, numbers, um, you can uh, do it with the info panel here. And uh, this is showing me that I'm getting an RGB value of somewhere around 40, 30, 30. Um, so my sky is a little bit redder than it is green or blue. That's probably fine, but um, what I, I ideally want to bring those numbers like down into the teens uh, for my sky background. So I'm just going to apply yet another curves adjustment layer here and one more time reset my black point. which also helps with uh, bringing down that distracting dust. So that's it. Uh, we took this from uh, an initial, let me show you, let me just go ahead and open up just what one light looked like. That's just one 30 second picture. Uh, we took 70 of those for about 40 minutes of data, stacked them with Deep Sky Stacker, and ended up with this uh, fairly presentable picture of the Orion Nebula and the Running Man Nebula. I hope you enjoyed this video, and um, if you uh, have any ideas for future videos, please let me know um, in the comments. And if you uh, want to watch the version of this using GIMP, uh, just look right below in the description, or if you're interested in Pix Insight and see what we can do with that, Again, just look right in the description below and you can see how I process this same image with those programs. Thanks so much for watching. Meow.